Hello, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk About It. We're here to investigate incest and destigmatize childhood sexual crimes. Many people don't want to talk about it. We do. My next guest with me today is Kevin Boyd, and he is the author of Blessings in Freedom, Dispelling the Myth. I am so excited for him to be with us today. I'm excited to hear his story and his journey. And with that, Kevin, I like to always start with what your motivation was to write this book and what your motivation is to be here with us today and share your story. Hello. First of all, thank you for having me. You're welcome. It's always a pleasure to add value to people's lives and to share my story. Um, it's a story of uh, from tragedy to triumph, you know, to triumph. So I believe that sharing my story can offer people hope because um, molestation and abuse is something that happens every single day. And it happens across all, all walks of life. You know, it doesn't matter your religion. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter your financial status. These things happen in families day after day. And a lot of times it's done in secret and the victim has no way out and they don't know how to manage those feelings, you know, after, you know, the violation has taken place. So, you know, I'm here to offer hope that, you know, what happened to you in your past doesn't have to define your present nor your future, because I'm a living proof that you can rise above, you know, traumatic experiences. So. It's my honor and my duty to share, to help, you know, somebody else just be encouraged that, you know, life, your life is not over because of trauma. Right. I love that. You know, and it is true when you know the right thing to do, it's so hard not to share. People always want me to be quiet, Kevin, but I can't because God has been so good and brought me so far. My story is also a story of uh, father daughter incest. I know that your story is father son incest and these things are yes. not talked about. And so with that, if you could just bring us in, you open your book with this profound, uh, you come home and you're not feeling well, right? If you could just bring us into the yes. story so people understand and then share as much of your story as you're comfortable with. Okay, sure. And you can, you can stop me at any time, you know, <laughs> okay. energy, I don't okay. want to be like I'm rambling on. Okay. Um, so, yes, it all started um, when I was five years old. Let me give you a little bit of my family background. So I grew up in a small family in Los Angeles, a mother, father, and one brother. My brother's two years older. We grew up in a Christian home. My mother was a faithful Christian and a school teacher, elementary school. So we went to church faithfully every Sunday, come rain, come shine. It wasn't an option. We were just raised that way. And I thank God for that foundation. But the flip side of that, my father was a complete opposite. He wasn't in the church. He was, he, um, you know, he was an alcoholic. He worked in a, what do you call it? He worked in a nightclub. So he was a bartender. Mm, okay. So he was home during the day. And my mother was home, of course, at night after school and things. But um, I didn't really have much of a relationship with my father, at least not the typical, you know, go outside and toss the football. And, you know, I didn't have any of those experiences. My father wasn't really an uh, emotional or nurturing type of man. <clears throat> and so this particular day in elementary school, I remember like yesterday, I had a fever and the fever was so extreme. I knew they were going to send me home. But I also knew my mother was at work at her classroom. So I said, well, mom can't get me. I'm going to have to go. My dad's going to have to come get me. Now, at five years old, I was excited because, remember, I didn't spend a lot of time with my father. I really was what they call a mama's boy. And so this particular day in my five-year-old brain, I was excited because I said, I get to spend a day with my dad. Right. It's understandable. <laughs> So he got me home and the fever was so extreme that he had to take my clothes off. I mean, I was burning up. I remember it like it was yesterday. 
so crazy. I remember that. And I was, um, so he removed my clothes, right? And so he said, lay on top of me. At five years old, I knew something wasn't right about that. I didn't have the words to put it in. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, I said, mm, I don't think I'm supposed to be laying on top of my dad with no clothes on. <clears throat> but I wanted the attention, the the just the fact that I was spending time with my dad, I dismissed it as far as it being right or wrong. I didn't even dwell on that part. I was more excited that I was having interaction of any kind with my father. Right. And, and he's your, people he's don't your, yeah, he's your rule maker. No, right. right? Yeah, he's and the, he's and your the rule maker. Is, and yes. And the thing is, people don't understand that um, a lot of times predators, they do what's called a grooming process. Mm -hmm. So that particular day, nothing happened other than, you know, the in inappropriate, uh, you know, laying on top of my father knew, but right. it didn't go any further than that. That was just to get me comfortable with, you know, going the wrong way. And so over a period of time, is when things been, begin to progress. Because, you know, there were many, many times when I would be at home, you know, with my father. Because remember, my mother's an elementary school teacher. She drove, I mean, she worked hours away. So by the time I got home from school, of course, she still wasn't home. So there was that span of time before she got home that I was home from school because school was two blocks away, three blocks away. So within that time, he was able to, you know, to do what he did. And so it it progressed, it progressed, it progressed. You know, I don't want to be graphic, but, you know, all the things that you could imagine, oral, you know, um, uh, you know we'll, we'll just stop there. Uh, but, right. you know, so, but this goes so on it, till till your teen years? Yes. So it went on through my teen years, and one of the things, one of the things um, that kept it going so, I want to say steadily, is because he told me, if I ever told anybody, he would kill me. Mm. You know, because people always say, well, when you were a teenager, you should have been able to fend him off. Mm. That's easy for you to say, yeah. but you have to understand my mind it right. wasn't just sexual. My mind was caught up in this stuff. You know, my identity was caught up in this stuff. And then you have to understand the fear. He said he would kill me. Right. So you think I'm going to tell somebody what he's doing and he threatened to kill me? Right. Well, I'm not telling anybody Exactly. Nothing. Kevin, the incest is a crime. This is not a sexual fantasy for a child in any way it's a crime and i had somebody say to me i thought it was really cool latarsha said if your father can do that to you imagine what else he can do to you and so these are crimes that are against our young little tiny bodies and that it, people that try to change that <laughs> have never lived in that world because like you said really it all starts with fear it doesn't start because we don't have a choice in the matter, right? They come to us. They're our fathers. We want to love them. It's a God-given right for us to have love with our parents. We don't know anything different, but we also know that it doesn't feel right, that we're terrified of it. We don't want Something anybody else to find it. out. Right. We, the secret is between us. So go ahead and keep going. I 100% yeah, understand. Oh my right. Yeah, right. You can't secret. tell that secret. The secret and the guilt from the secret. Because yes. see, then, you know, I w I've always been a thinker, even as a kid. So mm -hmm. I would always contemplate, okay, if I told, what would be the repercussions? Right. Would I really, would he really beat me up like he said he would? Or would my mother believe me? Uh, would they possibly get a divorce? Because something I did to break the family up. So, right. you know, there was all these questions. So I was like, I, I don't, I'm just stuck. I'm just stuck well, in you, this. And that makes me think, Kevin, I know that you were very close with your mother, but in these years, it's very interesting to me that 
moms are somewhere absent around all this abuse. Can you talk to me a little bit about what, what do you think sure. made her absent or that you couldn't go to her and disclose? Yeah. So my father in general, just his character, he was not a great role model for anything. He wasn't mm -hmm. the best husband. You know, remember he was a bartender. So he, he you know, he encountered several hoochie women. I'm just going to call it what it is. He encountered several floozy women, you know, so he always had some lady chasing after him, you know, you know, and, and they're doing, doing their stuff. But the thing was, he was at some point, he was disrespectful. His little, his little floozies would come and pick him up like a block from the house. And, you know, everybody where I lived, I lived in a big, wide, neighborhood the streets were huge wide so you could see from here you could see from here way to the other end of the street mm -hmm. so there was no sneaking you know what i mean you pick somebody at the corner we see you like like a full full screen movie right. so his little ladies would pick him up at the corner and i'd be so embarrassed because i'd be like the whole neighborhood sees you right. getting in the car with these ladies and so, your mother saw that. So she was more so I'm on sure his... she knew. Yeah. So so what I'm saying is my mother, um, my mother was the type, I guess, she just she knew, but she just held it all in and just act like everything was peaches and cream, you know. I mean, I had they had their issues and stuff, and you know, when she got fed up, she would talk about his indiscretions and things, but to me it's like when you allow it, that it's like when you're passive about things, mm -hmm. that gives the wrong, the wrong sign that you're okay with it, which right. she wasn't. But right. I felt like she should have stood up to him a long time ago. So I'm saying that to say, I don't think she really, I don't think she, I think she was dealing with enough with him just not being a great husband. I don't think she wanted to add to it you know, the, the possibilities of what he might be doing to her kids. Well, it wasn't her kids because he didn't do anything to my brother, thank God. But one thing I do say, my mother did know that I didn't, I wasn't particularly fond of my father. Now, why? She didn't know. But she did know that I didn't really like that dude, you know, which is why I gravitated to be in a mama's boy. I mean, I idolized my mother. My mother went to the nail shop. I'm going to the nail shop. Right. My mother went wherever. I'm going to the mall with my mother. Forget basketball. Forget throwing the football around. I don't right. want to be See, anything and, like my dad. Right. See, and, my and, dad liked sports. So oh, I hate okay. his sports. Right. I, I don't want to be. I don't be. I don't want to do nothing that he does. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. But and that, and and so that first that five year old feeling where you tell me I I didn't have any time with my father, and so this thought I thought I've got his undivided time. This feels good, but in truth, I know because I've lived this, Kevin. It does not feel good, and so we're babies and we don't understand what to expect. But as their abuse all of this sexual escapades with them. It's awful. It doesn't feel good at all. It's and we toxic. Do no, it's very toxic. And so- It's toxic, but it becomes our normal. It becomes it our reality. Normal. Yeah, it does. So we, we, we become we, desensitized we to it. We do, you know, and so that trauma amnesia, I wanted to talk to you about that. Um, I was raped by my father. He actually began to sodomize me when I could get pregnant. And do you know, I blocked that, Kevin. I got married. I left his house at 18 and went right to another man. I didn't take those sodomies with me. Those stayed okay. at his house. I didn't remember anymore. I mean, you kind of know somewhere, but not really. I'm not going to think about it because it happens so often that when it happens, my mind just put it somewhere else. It didn't you live blank with me. Out. Yes. And, and talk to me about that, because I think that's another thing that's difficult for people that do not live every single day abuse. You don't you're not in those moments anymore. You go somewhere else. Did, did Is that how you lived in those times where because when it's just chronic and year after year, we don't stay present all the time. You know, it's 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 so complex because. It is. 
Um, at some point, I used to think there was this, uh, at some point, I used to think that it was all my fault. Now, I don't know how I came up with that, but somewhere in the midst of all of this, I start to say, it must have been something that I did to open this door. Because I, I, I don't know how it got open, but it has to be my fault some kind of way. What? And so my whole life, I had this stupid question of what did I do to deserve this? Of course, there was no answer because I didn't do anything. I mean, it all but started with it him. Does, it does. And I think that their relationship with us builds that in us, though, Kevin. They want to make us believe that this is a love affair kind of a thing. And I, and again, yeah, this so is very, sick. yeah, it's, it's very complicated. But I know I felt like I was my father's favorite. I felt like... He gave me love that he gave nobody else. He would give me a radio or every once in a while, but not very often, not very often would he give me anything, but they bring you in this sort of collusion. And so unfortunately what that does, the design that Satan has created these crimes around mm -hmm. says you're as guilty as the guy doing this to you. And yeah. because there are fathers, we don't know any other design other than what they've built in us. So it is the secret place. They always build a secret, you know what I mean? Like this little secret place we go to, it's our secret mm -hmm. love. You never call it secret abuse, not in a child's mind. Yeah, It must be good because it's my father, but we know it's not. And, and as you say, it's very complicated, but they always make us feel that we're complicit in the act with them. Don't they? It's, Somewhere, it's, it's, it's yeah, really... that we don't say no. Sometimes I, I hear people say, I've read in your book, actually, Kevin, this was a, or I, or I can't remember. I, I read your book and I also listened to your story, but you said that when he tried to take it further, you told him no, when it, you know, became to the point of sodomy. I have you the said, boundary. I said, I'm not doing sodomy. I don't care right. what you do. You can and, hang me up by, you know, hang me by a thread, but I'm not doing it. So and see, eventually, and he did, yeah, he eventually stopped trying. He knew that was the the cutoff, so to speak. But I mean, it was enough oral. Who cares? Right. Still, well, you know, and the right. damage was still done. Exactly. And so the problem with that too, though, when I, I thought about that and coming through incest for some of the time I was little, just like you till I left that house, you know, I wonder if you thought, I would think, well, if I said no to that, what if I said no when I was five? But we don't know how to say no when we're five. And now you're probably too big, late. It was too late. Exactly. It was too late. And you so know, when, that's when go ahead. that was in my teen years. Right. When I was able to, you know, be like, no, I don't, you know, no, no, no. And then um, I also was able to, you know, as I got older, I was able to stay home i mean stay out of the way till my mom got home right you so know you could you start running interference thing. you gotta bring your butt in the house you don't get right. to say oh i'm gonna stay out here till mom no you're not right. you're coming in the house because your daddy said get your butt in his house so you started so, but when i got you know 15 16 you know they're not kind of you know i uh, make up this. something oh i have to do something after right. school you know anything that to not be in that house until my mother came home. So, you know, at some point in my teens, I was kind of able to maneuver, but every now and then he would still catch me. It's, you know, I, mean? I get it. Yes. So it, it, I do think that they, it, yeah, in our teen years, I think that they realize that we have more options than we had when we were small, because even in my case, my father did not come into my room very often anymore. And and they kind of wean, they kind of get weaned off of it. They do. And, and maybe it's because they like children. I don't really know. I think they're, you know, yeah. these men are usually hedonistic. My, my father also stepped out on my mom a lot. And yes. my mom was more angry about him stepping out with other women than anything he did to us kids. So it's very interesting. I think the yep. relationships with all of us are very complicated, right? These guys are good manipulators, aren't they? That's what they are. You, that, and, and, um, you know, on, Unfortunately, um, I have I have a sister, um, you know, by a, a, another woman, but me and her, we talked recently and my father violated her as well. Oh, wow. But we also 
have found out that um, in his town where he lives, because he doesn't live here anymore, but we found out that there's been allegations of him with other children. So this is, you know, I used to think that it was just me, mm -hmm. but clearly this is something that he does on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, I think he's, I think he's simmered down only because he don't probably don't have a choice because I believe he's about, he's in his eighties now. Let's see, I'm 57, 67, 77. Yeah, he's got to be in his early 80s. You know, and that's... So that's by, by, you know, Mother Nature may have simmered him down, but... But, and that's an know. important point to bring up. Pedophiles, it's proven when, when people, you know, study them, they don't just abuse one child. A pedophile is a pedophile and he's going to abuse he or she, because there's female pedophiles as well. They're going to abuse anytime they get a chance. My mother actually was also a pedophile in our home. And when I talked about having to watch her in the bathtub, my uh, I had a nephew that confirmed that, oh, I had to watch grandma and my own daughter. There's three generations that she would stand, you know, make everybody watch her bathe. So it's, it's so important. I think this is why we're doing this, Kevin. If we don't talk about it, generations are going to be hurt. Children that are around these pedophiles will be hurt. I think very few of them change. Honestly, it's one of those things in life that I think you're so given over to darkness by the time you can hurt a child. I don't know if only God can save you. And that's not my issue. I'm not here to save a pedophile, but I am here to find the people that they've heard, if that makes sense. So well, I do think that your father had, it's very interesting to me that he didn't uh, hurt your brother. We went to counseling in my family nothing. and, and that's crazy. Is he older than not, you or not younger? One in discrepancy. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, ne I never understood the why, but, right. um, okay. So Predators, how can I say, hurt people, hurt people. That is a true statement. So let me tell you what, what almost happened with me. I was babysitting. I was a teenager. I believe I was in my late teens. I was babysitting. And I've just come to grips to be able to tell this, but I know there's, there's healing and truth. I, I was in my late teens. I was babysitting, and maybe like a two, three year old. All of a sudden, I heard a voice say, Do it. Mm. And I'm thinking, Do it. Mm. And it said it again. It said, Do it. And in that moment, I thought about violating a child the very same way that I was violated. And when I went to do it, the Lord stopped me midstream. And the Holy Spirit said two things. He said, if you do this, you will open up something that you cannot close. And he also said, think about everything that you've had to go through as a result of this. Would you want to do this to anybody, child or otherwise? And it's terrified me <clears throat> because I realized that seed that was in my father was implanted in me. And if I didn't take control over, over it, I would be the next pedophile. Right. I said, God, I cannot. I said, I don't I don't know what I'm struggling or not struggling with, but this I will never mm -hmm. in my life go down that road. And it scared me, but it was a good scare. Right. That no, that I, moment, I would say I would say, Kevin, God is with you. That's what I would say. Yeah. At that moment, I never looked at a kid. I never thought about it. It never was a temptation. I said, oh, we're going to get delivered from this today because yes. I can't be, I refuse to be my father again. Right. You know, it's but, funny that I love that you say, oh, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Okay. Finish. Yeah. This is a good part. No, I'll finish. tell you this part. Yes. So, but even though I didn't get the pedophilia part of it, I became a master manipulator. Woo! Listen. When I say master manipulator, 
you know, I liked masculine guys, I guess, because my father was masculine, right? Duh, duh. And sometimes the masculine guys would not necessarily be out of the closet, you know, what we call the down low guys. And the thing with that is that <clears throat> a lot of them hid. So a lot of them, you know, it was like, call me after midnight, call me at two o'clock in the morning when nobody's out. I don't want anybody to see me associated with you. You know, I don't want anybody to know what I'm doing. But the thing about that is the type of guys that I liked, they they were not really approachable uh in a in a in a in a public setting, you know, or as they say, down low. So a lot of times they would be what they call gay for pay, meaning in their warped mind, they're not really gay. They're just doing it because, you know, you're offering them some weed or some, uh, you know, some cash or, you know, a, a free meal or whatever, you know, whatever it is. Um, they're basically pimping themselves for the, for whatever they can get out of it. So in their mind, they're not gay. But me... Because I was a manipulator, I didn't care about any of that. All I care is if I think you're cute and I want to have relationships with you, then whatever I got to do to get you, I'll do it. If I got to get you high, which I should smoke weed, mm -hmm. if I got to give you $50 and I give you $50, if, you know, whatever so, I have to do, right. to, you know, to as long as I can accomplish what I wanted, then I would lie. I would, I would, you know, I'd get them drunk. I'd do whatever. So, listen and so I to realized this. that I was no better than my father because I would manipulate guys for my sexual addiction. You know, so I was my father in a manifested in a different way. So Terrible. I understand that. And let me, but let me say this. So in your book, it says right here. Dad and I had nothing in common outside of our weird secret uh, encounters. Now, Dad and I had nothing in common but for our weird secret encounters. Now, think I about this. I got to read my own book again. <laughs> <laughs> that is in your introduction. And now what you just explained to me is that, is this manipulation or are you doing exactly what you had been doing for years and years with your father? And one of the reasons, it's it's the same difference if I go and I'm promiscuous as a woman. Am I my father or am I emulating the abuse that was done to me? And, I, and I'm curious to, for me, I know that, you know what I mean? It's So it's not weird or, of course, I had way more sex than I should have and it's outside of God's yeah. will and all of that. But for yeah. a woman, it's a little bit more, you know, stereotypical or whatever. So, but to be in then in a gay relationship that's hidden, we take on a lot of desires or is it that we're just living out the things that were done to us? And until that pattern is stopped and God comes in, it was hard for me yeah. to let go of the religion that I was grew up in because I didn't mm -hmm. drink or do anything, but I, I had mm -hmm. sexual stuff. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, when Jesus found me, it, I was kind of a wreck because religious rules kind of keep you in check, if that makes sense. And then Jesus kind of no, untatters you, right? And so, so talk so to me. So let me, me tell you about that. Yeah, talk to uh, me about that. Yeah, so, so you know, so complicated because it is very complicated. I think for me, for me, the promiscuity was I, ne I never got the appropriate love that I was supposed to get from my father. Mm -hmm. So the only interaction we had was the sexual. So unfortunately, I equated sex with love. Right. Sex was the closest thing that I had to love and affection and feeling cared for and, you know, be feeling pleasure and things like that. So mm -hmm. I began the promiscuity was putting a band-aid what it was, was I really had a void of needing to be loved and to be justified, you know. And because I didn't get that, sex was my band-aid. I yes. feel good in the moment, yes. but then after, I feel horrible. I right. feel like a piece of trash. And, and doesn't that, it's exactly how our childhood made us feel, right? Like, because, you know. Horrible. Yes. After the fact. After the fact. And but so. It was self-destruction. Because I is. kept doing it. I said, this is the last time 
I'm not doing this again. I'm not, I'm not right. going to call him again. I'm not going to pay for sex again. And it right. just kept, it's just spiraled completely out of control. It and does. then you talked about the, the religious aspect of church. Mm -hmm. I grew up in church. I grew up in music ministry. So I've been in the choir my entire life. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I saw some of these things operating in the church. Right. So that made me think, well, I don't even know if if deliverance was really a, a real thing. Because I'm mm -hmm. seeing some pastors involved in, in discretion. I'm seeing some choir members, you know, going to the club like me. So right. I was like, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, if deliverance well, and is a real thing. And so here, you know what, I'm going to talk about this with you for a minute, because my father was Southern Baptist. While I am not saying all Southern Baptists are wrong, I yeah, am saying that there is a great big spirit of religion that hides incest. And I am telling yes, you, this is, this is the biggest thing that people do not understand, why they're not caught. The church hides them, but it is this great big spirit of religion and incest sits right behind it. Jesus has nothing to do with it. So he exactly gets a bad, what it is. He gets a bad rap all the time. And so I always like to ask people, where was God in your abuse? And you know what? God gets blamed. Satan doesn't. And God didn't do it. Satan did. So Every talk time. to me about that. That That's exactly right. Every so that time. spirit of religion is that's not the God of the Bible. It, it's so true. You know. Yeah. So keep going. But, and every, I love that in your story yeah, too, because it is, we were hurt by the spirit of religion, not God. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you, uh, you know, there was, there, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. This is all I'm going to say. Is I, I also wanted to say, I was sorry to you that when you went to a different church and tried to change your spiritual experience. Oh my experience. God, I was going to talk about that. You were shut down. Ooh. And Kevin, I my heart yeah. hurt for you. Tell and the I, story because they okay. people listening wouldn't know what we're talking about. And I'm sorry, okay. but when I heard that story. So bring the, bring the listener and the viewer into okay. the story we're talking about. Okay, so I had went around the mulberry bush and I just got tired. I didn't like, I didn't want to be in a lifestyle anymore, but I didn't know how to get out of it. Um, one of the issues, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> I felt like the, my church that I've gone to, I felt like I was too familiar with everybody to receive deliverance there. Because remember, there were some guys in the choir that were living like I'm living, you know, and even some ministers I knew kind of had a shaky, shaky, uh, uh, you know. And you mean shaky, hom homosexual uh, experiences. Yeah, yeah, real shaky stuff going on. So I said, well, maybe I need to go somewhere else. Um, I'm also a hairstylist, a celebrity hairstylist of, of 40 years. So I've worked oh, in Beverly cool. Hills. Wow. I've done photo shoots, magazines, competitions, all that stuff. I'm retired now. But at that time, I worked in a salon and some of my co-workers, they were from the apostolic faith like me. And so there was the church where I said, you know, the pastor was big time, you know, so I figured, and I really liked the church. I liked the services. I liked everything about it. Now, I do remember backstory. He was very dogmatic, very, you, you know, you do this, you're going to hell. You know, he was very that. But I felt like maybe I needed that kind of structure because of everything that I had came out of. So willy nilly, everything goes. I said, well, maybe this is the discipline that I needed. So I wasn't afraid of his staunch, you know, I wasn't afraid of his. I understand, right. Yeah, right. I, 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 you know, I got it. I mean, I've been in church all these, my life. Right, so these I, rules are going to so help me. Was, I need stronger yeah. rules. <laughs> so I, I, didn't, I didn't have a problem with the rules and regulations. But mm -hmm. the thing is this, my coworkers had told him about my lifestyle prior to me going into the office and meeting him. So when I went in the office, I had no clue that they told him my business about my lifestyle. And so when I went in the office, as soon as I sat down, he said, you're coming from Greater Bethany, right? I said, yes, sir. He said, let me just tell you, over here, we don't have no sissies. We don't have none of that gay stuff. So if you're coming over here 
and you think you're going to bring that stuff over here, you might as well go back to where you're coming from. It hurt my feelings and it disappointed me because I felt like you're supposed to be so close to God, then why the Holy Spirit didn't show you that I was coming here to get free? That lets right. me know you're not as connected to God as you claim to be because you would have known why I really came and you would have known that that was the least of my intentions is to come over here promoting anything ungodly. So you you failed the test. So that, but what it did, it, 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 it killed every hope mm -hmm. that I could get free. It killed all of that. And I said, well, this oh, is and it. I'm sure that it released shame in you. <laughs> I said, this is it. I said, there is no deliverance. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck in this. I don't, you know, that nobody can help me get out of it. So I might as well embrace it full fledged. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to agree with the enemy that I was a gay Christian. Uh, I said, okay. forget it. I'm I'm a gay. I'm just it. I'm a gay Christian. That's it. I don't, it's nothing to fight. It's nothing to get free from. Nobody only if you don't understand it, you don't understand it. Well, but. see, and this is why I think it's so important for us to share these things. And I want you to finish. But one of the things that I say so much is God will find you right where you are in your story. You do not have to change. You do not have to clean up. The blood of Jesus does all of that for you. Just come to him. And as you move in his healing and his love, all of those things do fall away, right? Talk to me a little bit about that. So, so let's talk about the my, the darkest, you know, when I got to the end of my spectrum. Yes, okay. So now, now I'm giving in to everything. I'm addicted to weed. I socially drink. Um, as far as the promiscuity, you know, now I have a, 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 a I have an adult gay friend. He was in the church and in the choir with me and stuff. So we were partners in crime. So now we're going to gay clubs. Now we're going to sex clubs. Uh, for those that don't that don't know, there's place there's places that people go and just randomly hook up with strangers and just have sex. Um, and some of them open 24 hours like they have actual, I don't know if they have it now, but at that time they had like actual movie theaters and we would do inappropriate stuff in after in the oh, theater. Yeah, I come from Portland, Oregon. So, I know, I've heard all yeah, about bookstores, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So just a lot of places where I could randomly pick up guys. So I'm doing this on a regular basis, drinking, smoking. I'm still going to church every Sunday. In the choir every single Sunday. And I realized one time I said, I'm not going to those places anymore. And two hours later, I was right back there and I said, okay, something is not connecting here. I said, I sincerely said I wasn't going to be out here and I'm out here. That's when I knew I said, okay, God, I have crossed a line that I can't recover from. I said, whatever this is, it has overtaken me to no matter what I say, it takes control of me. I got to, you got to get me out of this. Mm -hmm. So now I'm, now I'm getting ready to marry a man. We were going to, this is when oh, Obama wow. first legalized gay marriage. <laughs> so, you know, there was only a few states where you could get the, the the license. So we were going to move to a gay affirming state. We were going to buy a, a house. We're going to buy a dog. We were going to adopt a child. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I did not ruin a child's life. We were going to adopt a child. And I'm all excited, making the plans, Try to figure out my budget. Okay, I gotta put I need this much and I gotta do this and I gotta get a job and you know, hairstyle so I can get a job anywhere. So <clears throat> one night I went to bed all excited, 
And the next day I woke up, it's like God had removed the veil from my eyes. Mm -hmm. I began to see myself the way that God sees me. And I began to understand that this lifestyle is not pleasing to God, according to the scriptures. And the Lord said, I want, he said, I know you want out of this lifestyle. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to my spirit. He basically said, I know you want out of this lifestyle. You suffer. You're not happy. And I want to bring you deliverance. I want to bring you freedom. I want to bring you peace. He said, and I'm going to use you and your story to help so many people. Because, you know, I used to always wonder, why did this have to happen to me? Mm -hmm. And now I know it was a call on my life. I'm actually a prophet. I don't go around saying that a lot because there's warfare that comes with that. But I am mm -hmm. a prophet. And what I realized is the enemy had uh, targeted me in my, you know, in my youth because he never wanted me to walk in the fullness of who God called me to be. So the Lord told me that he was going to set me free, right? But he also told me, and I, I say this because people have to understand life is a vapor. We're only here for a moment. We're not going to live here forever. Only what you do for Christ will last. The Lord told me specifically that this was my last chance. Wow. I'm going to pause right there. Yeah. I hear you. The I hear Lord you, brother. told me, this is your last chance for deliverance. I said, mm, what exactly does God mean by that? I came up with only two options. I said, either he's going to turn me over to a reprobate mind or I'm going to die suddenly in my sin without the chance to repent. I said, neither one of those is a good deal. I said, Lord, I'm going to have to take you up on your offer. And my only request was God deliver me completely. Because remember, I dealt with the downloads and the bisexuals and, and all that. And I really didn't have a lot of respect for them. Because a lot of them are living double lives, having wives and girlfriends mm -hmm. and sleeping with men and not even be honest enough to tell them. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I wanted to be was down low. Mm -hmm. The last thing I wanted to be was one of these people talking about I'm delivered and I'm free and then I'm still masturbating at two o'clock in the morning. I didn't want to be him. So mm -hmm. I said, you have to take every and all of it away. And he, uh, we got a deal. So he did. And it's amazing because remember how we talked about the reli religiosity? Yes. The first thing he told me to do was I had to come out of the church. I said, wait just a minute. How in the world am I supposed to get free if you call me out of the church? I said, the church is where everything is. Guess what God said? I love telling this part. He said, I have to deprogram you. Oh, my God. Yeah. What did you say, God? He said, son, I have to deprogram you. Mm -hmm. I said, this is bananas. And what he told me was, he said, you were the person in the scripture when I said a form of godliness, but denying the power therein. He said, that mm -hmm. was the life you lived. You were a professional Christian. What is a professional Christian? Professional Christian, they know the scriptures. Mm -hmm. They know how to look the part, you know, sharp every Sunday. They know how to dance and run up and down the aisle. Um, but he said, he said, even speaking tongues, you spoke in tongues. He said, but your, your life wasn't a holy life. He said, so your dance wasn't a holy dance because your life wasn't holy. He said, a professional Christian. I said, oh my God. So the the what has saved my life and what has kept me is understanding that religion is different from relationship. Yes. And so in my developing my relationship with God, I found the intimacy 
And in the intimacy is where I found my strength and I began to receive deliverance. So all that going to church, every revival, every prayer meeting, every every Sunday service, every concert, it only served a minimal purpose because there was no fruit that came behind it because it was just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. But when I started doing spiritual principles, I saw spiritual results. When I start fasting, hallelujah, glory to God. When I start praying, hallelujah, yatabashi, hallelujah, glory to God. When I started reading the word and meditating on it, mm -hmm. when I changed my friends, protect your ear gates and your eye gates, when I stop looking at certain things, <laughs> hallelujah, when I stop listening to certain things, then God was able to start working on me. But it was, mm -hmm. I had to submit. I couldn't say, oh, ain't nothing wrong with this and ain't nothing wrong with that. Right. I had to line up everything with what the word says. Mm -hmm. People have to understand this in order to walk with God. You've got to die. You, it cannot be your will and God's will. It can't be your way and his way. And the most false statement that we have now is living your truth. That is the worst thing you can do is live your mm -hmm. truth. Thank you, Lord. I get it. I get it. And <laughs> it's true. And you the wrong way. Right. And Kevin listening, I, I just, I so understand. I was raised in religion. I was not raised by the God of the Bible. And when I came out, but, I, but at four years old, I did meet Jesus. And my mom said, we don't know how, cause they weren't yet religious. They were drinking hedonistic prigs really. And so then they found religion, they found the spirit of religion, they cleaned themselves up. But when I was this little girl, I met this kind of different thing. So I always tell people, yeah, the God of my father is not the God that I know today. And I want my family to know that because the children behind me, it is confusing like what you just explained. It's very confusing. What do you mean I have to leave the church? That's everything godly. But when godliness tells you that sin is okay, there's a problem. <laughs> There's a great big problem, right? That, oh, don't be judgmental. What they really mean is, oh, don't tell me what you're, I'm doing is wrong. They're such hypocrites. <laughs> right? They're such hypocrites because everything, everything and anything went on in the church, but they're the yes. ones saying everybody's going to hell. Well, then exactly. after this church is going too. Right. Because uh, all the, you know, all the private stuff I knew about people, I'm like, well, I don't know. You guys are not the greatest examples. But anyway, um, wow! So you know, it's... It, was just, it was, it was, you know, the inti intimacy with God. It was, yes. it, it really changed my life. And and the reason I share this is because so many people have a loved one in that lifestyle, and a lot of Christians, and they don't necessarily know how to minister mm -hmm. to people in their lifestyle, they don't want to be offensive, mm -hmm. you know, but then it's a thin line because you don't want them to think that you're condoning that life as well, but you do want them to know, know that you love them unconditionally. So and particularly a lot of parents have a burden because they feel like a disconnect, like they don't know how to reach their child or yeah, their child without offending them. You know, because they can come off religious, you know, I didn't raise you that way and you go mm -hmm. into hell. And, you know, and that's not going to really encourage anybody to want to change. You know, so what I realized is it's really a work of the Holy Spirit. There's no other way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, aversion is a demon. I know people don't like to hear this kind of talk, but it is a demon. It is a demonic spirit. And you cannot counsel out a demon. Now I'm not I have nothing against counseling. Counseling helps a lot of people in a lot of ways. But you cannot counsel out something spiritual. So you, what what is needed is deliverance. Well, and you know deliverance a third, right? A third and of, repentance. 
Right. And a third of Jesus ministry on earth was that's what he did. He'd turn around and say <laughs> out of them. And so people forget Ow. that. Yeah. And so the other thing, though, I really do from from my from my huge heart of what God has really spoken to me was God helped me see how the design of incest implicated me into these crimes as I move forward. So in other words, my promiscuity was exactly designed in me coming through childhood sexual crimes. So talk to me about how you, do you, do you see what I mean by the overlay? It sets us up and predisposes us, unfortunately, to just continue to walk in this way until God brings a love in and restores our heart and says you were never meant to have been abused yeah, and abandoned exactly. like that. But I do it, think it that takes these- a divine encounter. It does, but these childhood crimes, they set us up on the wrong path. Don't you think, Kevin? Yeah, so the, the, the you know, I try to, I try to give parents tips on how to prevent this from happening because the harsh reality is this. The reason Satan attacks us in our childhood because if he can tarnish us from the beginning, mm-hmm. then it's 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 we have the potential to be dysfunctional adults. Right. And so, unfortunately, when a child's innocence is taken, there's no regaining of it. Because how can you unlearn what you've already learned? How right. can you not experience what you've already experienced? So once you've been opened up to s- sexual things you can't there's no rewind i mean you know sometimes we have the cognitive dissonance where we just you know blot blot it out but but it's still there Mm -hmm. it's just dormant it's still there so the thing is you know at five years old now you know about oral sex and Mm -hmm. masturbation and orgasm it's too late right then indoctrinated into something that that you shouldn't have been in. So mm-hmm. the only thing that can be done at that point is the healing and the deliverance. But you can't erase it. it ain't, you you can't, you can't erase, erase it. it. And and I you know I love that. I love listening to you so much. I just I can just feel my spirit just come alive listening to you. But one of the most important things for us to also say with all of this discussion is that God brings his love into those places. And he would tell you, he understands the perversion. He would tell you, he's not scared of your story. He would tell you that he has been in those rooms with you, that you were not alone. He would tell you, bring me with you. Don't try to exclude him. I mean, one of the things that I love the most is people say, oh, when I went there, when I shot up or whatever, my daughter was a heroin addict because I married an abuser for 10 years. And we don't want to bring God there. You know what I learned and what brought me out of my dysfunction and my sin and all those things? I brought him right with me. Kevin, I got to a place where I said, not the religious God. I mean, the real God who was going to look at me. And I said, I'm not going to leave you this time. I'm going to go with this married guy, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to bring you. And guess what? I don't go with married guys anymore. But I used to. I used to do all kinds of stuff. But I decided one thing, no matter what I did, I was bringing the real God who saw, but mostly the God who loved me and the God that I needed to comfort me in those places. And that's what changed me, Kevin, was his love. When we talk about deliverance for me, it was his love came into those places where I felt so alone. And so um, it, that, it changes us. Right. And so I don't want it to, I, that the, the place of religion brings that hellstone and you know, fire. God finds you where you are. He loves you exactly where you are in that moment. And you're right. You have to choose it. You have to accept it. You have to say, you're sorry. (laughs) Those things are come with it, but we're at time, but I feel like I just, no, go go right ahead. Go right ahead. What, what, say that again. Let's talk about forgiveness. Yep. Forgiveness. Let's talk about forgiveness. Okay. So um, a lot, a lot of times when people read my story, you know, they they're angry at my father. They say, "How could he do such a thing? What a terrible man! He deserves to be locked up." And, you know all this stuff. And one of the things that the Lord told me was that your father did not have the capacity to be the father that he should have been. I said, "What?" Mm-hmm. He said, "Your father did not have." 
the capacity to love you properly. I said, whoa. He said, and then he talked about impartation. <clears throat> and he said, there's only two impartations, good and evil. I said, okay. He said, he gave me an example. The example is, if I take spring water and I run it through a rusty pipe, <clears throat> What's going to be in the water? I said, rust particles. He said, that is impartation. What is in you is what is going to come out of you. He said, your father only did to you what was in him to do. So um, talking with my aunt, we put two and two together, and we realized that perversion runs in my family bloodline. Mm -hmm. You know, including my grandfather and God only knows, you know, what I don't, you know, I don't know my genealogy past him, but clearly there are some funny stuff going on down, the, you know, the generations. And so this was not something that just randomly happened. Right. This was, you know, it was, it was, a, it was in our, in our, in our bloodline. And so. Um, people would always ask me, what's my relationship with my father? And I said, well, I do talk to him occasionally, but it's nothing. It's very surface. It's just, hey, dad, how you doing? Okay, good. You're, you're alive. I'll talk to you next time. And that's really it, literally. But, right. but the thing is, they would ask me, had I forgiven him? And I said, oh, yes. Oh, yes, I've forgiven him. You know, trying to just... I think I was trying to be politically correct and look like I'm just this moral, you know, upstanding person. Good oh, yes, spirit of religion response. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> right. And, oh, oh, yes, I've forgiven him, right? right? Right. And so one day, Holy Spirit called me a liar. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you're a liar, right? And I said, God, I was so, so offended. I said, I can believe you called our... He said, you are a liar. I said, why? He said, because you're telling people that you've forgiven your father. He said, but you haven't forgiven him in your heart. I said, oh my God. And I realized he was absolutely right. I've forgiven him with my words, but in my heart, I still I still had a disdain for him. I still was like, Ugh, what is he calling me for? I don't want to talk to him. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was like, you didn't really forgive him. Now, I'm going to tell you why it was so hard for me to forgive him is because, you know, he told me that he would kill me. But right. So it finally came out. And I was I was an a, a and B student in high school. For some reason, my last year, senior year, I wanted to be the class clown. I think I was just looking for attention. And so my grades began to fall and I went in to meet the counselor, the dean at the time, because she knew me and she said, I don't know what's going on, but something is going on with you because you're acting out and, you know, doing all this stuff. And she just kept asking questions. And I said, why is she asking me all my business? Like, lady, leave me alone. I'm ready to get out this office. And she hit the jackpot. She said, is something going on at home? And I said, oh, I got to get out of here. She said, mm -mm, mm -mm. there's something going on at home. She said, there's something you're dealing with at home. You need to tell me what it is. What is going on? Something's going on at home. She just would not let it go. She said, something's going on at home. Do you want to tell me what it is? Well, she didn't tell me. She said, legally, I have to report it once I open my big mouth. So she said, oh, but it was a good setup. So I said, oh, my God. I said, my father's messing with me. Ding, ding, ding. Now the police, the whisk, here come the police, then whisk me away in the police car. Now I'm totally mortified and embarrassed because everybody mm -hmm. see me going away in the police car. So now they want to do. Oh, wow. So now I got to come back to school and tell them, make up something. Like, what am I going to tell them why I went away in the police car? But <clears throat> anyway, back to the forgiveness. So uh, the thing is, once it finally came out, 
my father never admitted it. I mean, we ended up having to go to counseling and all of that. And even in the counseling session, he would say, I don't know why I'm here. I haven't done nothing. I ain't never touched this boy. I don't know nothing. I don't know what he's talking about. So he made me look like a complete liar and a fool. So, of course, I didn't forgive him. So, um, you know, once I did the book and everything, and the Lord said I was a liar, I said, well, God, I really don't feel like he deserves my forgiveness. Because look what he did. It took, I'm taking me up to my 40s to get out of this. I said, so do I, I just don't think he deserves my forgiveness. And the Lord, he reminded me of the scriptures that says, if you don't forgive, your heavenly father will not forgive you and he won't hear your prayer. So I realized that I had to forgive him. And that's when the Lord told me that my father didn't have the capacity to forgive me. And what I want to say to people is this. When you forgive somebody, it's for you. It's not for them. It's for you. It's so that you cannot harbor and have this negativity and this resentment and this victim mentality. It's so that you don't have all those things in your heart. Because it's a scientific fact mm -hmm. that arthritis, a lot of times people that suffer with arthritis, they're bitter. They're bitter people. They have resentment. Somebody did something 20 years ago and they vowed, I will never forgive them. And they have that seed of bitterness in them. And it, it can result, it can manifest physically. A lot of people who have arthritis have some kind of unforgiveness, resentment in their heart that they have harbored for many years. And they've told themselves they are not going to ever forgive this person. So what I want to say is in forgiveness, it doesn't matter if the person apologizes or not. It doesn't matter if they acknowledge it or not. You have to forgive for your peace and for your freedom and to be obedient to what the word of God says. He says, we have to forgive. He said, if we don't have love, we don't have anything. So you can go through your whole life preaching and teaching and laying hands and giving to the poor and do all of that. And you will not make it in if you're not walking in love and forgiveness. Did not the Heavenly Father forgive us of our sins, we wouldn't be able to have salvation without forgiveness. So how can we want something that we're not willing to give to other people? So that, right. that's just not the godly way. Now, I will say this, it's not always easy. Again, that was not easy for me to forgive him, but I asked God to help me and he did. And I simply called my father, it was the shortest I said, I, I called you today to tell you that what you did to me really messed my life up. But mm -hmm. I also called to tell you that I love you and I forgive you. And that was it. And I've been, it just, it's something broke. Something broke immediately. It's like I had lost a thousand pounds. It's just. You know, I, I love that. And I'll tell you, um, the last, one of the last times I saw my mother, I, stood by her. It was very difficult because there was a lot of, um, kind of oral and that kind of stuff with between me and my mother. And I looked at her and I said, I forgive you for all of it. And you know what it felt like for me, Kevin was I had to let go of if, when, when you're angry or embittered at someone, you know, what you're kind of doing is keeping them close to you because we were never close. She didn't like me much. I didn't like her much, but I felt like if I was angry at her, it kind of kept some, you know, it kept her by me. And when I had, when I had to say, I'm sorry, it separated us, which is to me such a strong action of God. It made me separate from her. And maybe I didn't want to be separate. You know what I mean? Because I was still looking for that love from her and God was telling me, you have to, I've got to separate you two. And to me, that act of forgiveness, I'd never seen it quite that way as an act of separation. 
And while I don't want to be like her and be close to her, I did long for her love very much. And so anyway, that is a beautiful thing to end on. We are over time, but it's been so remarkable. And I love that you wanted to end with forgiveness. I want to just ask you if there's anything else that you'd like to leave. Kevin, thank you so much for your time today. I hope, oh, and I, I mean this genuinely, I'd like us to do more of this discussion because when it is incest, there's this multiple uh, facet so layer layers. that's very oh, difficult. Goodness, yes. It's very complicated. And yet it's very simple when you get close to Jesus, he just starts cutting it off. But it's very yes, good to have does. these, it's very good to have these discussions of being real. Like I'm not scared of how I lived because I know it's all forgiven now. But yes, I was scared too. of living that way at the time Thank I was you, living that way, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, so. it's, it's terrible. It's the guilt and the shame is terrible. It's terrible. But you know what? We also have to forgive ourselves. We do. We, we also have to forgive it's ourselves beautiful. because, you know, um, I it, I had to, it's just so much. The victim mentality. I had to make a choice that I wasn't going to be a victim anymore. What right. happened to me, I didn't have any control over it but I'm an adult now. I don't have to stay in the woe is me, mm -hmm. you know, no more woe is me. Let's, let's move forward and let's make the best out right. of the life that I have and, now. And right. So to I, not, to not use it as an excuse, right. This happened to me. So now I can do all this because this happened to me. We are responsible for where we go tomorrow. Yeah. That's a very yeah. good thing. Is there yeah, anything absolutely. else that you'd like to leave that you can mm -hmm. think about it for a minute? I'd like to just mm -hmm. give you a few minutes in closing to just, you know, share well, that what you stand for is a very huge thing. As you know, right okay. now, the woke crowd does not like people moving against homosexuality. And I think that is a that's design. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm going to turn exactly it over. That's exactly what I was going to uh, hone. That's a, that was the home run. So <laughs> I'm going to so give it the, back to you. The, the times that we live in, you know, the times that we live in, celebrate alphabet community oh everybody has their own choices i believe in everybody being able to make their own choices but those of us who believe in the bible who believe in jesus we have to go by what the bible says not what the world says not what the world condones not what the world justifies and so we live by a different standard and so that's going to come with persecution and it's going to come with labeling and, and whatever else it comes with, but I am a firm believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that the Lord sexual immorality. Um, it's not just the alphabet community, but fornication. Mm -hmm. I just believe that the Lord does not design us to be sleeping around. Mm -hmm. He said, one man, one woman, be fruitful and multiply. And I will challenge the alphabet community that you have to think for a second, two men or two women cannot be fruitful and multiply. So let's just leave that right there. That's just something to think about, you know. Um, but I just want to say this. If you desire, that's what I'm saying like that. If you desire a better way, if you desire to be free from any form of sexual immorality, whether it be alphabet community or pornography, masturbation, any of those things that we were not designed to be controlled by. I am a living witness and an example that you can be free and you do not have to struggle with those things secretly, shamedly, ashamedly, or anything like that, that the Lord loves you. And if you would just submit your life and your heart to him, any undesirable thing in your life that's not producing fruit, the Lord will, can, and wants to make you free. So you're looking at an ex-nymphomaniac. You're looking at an ex-social drinker, an ex-weed head, was addicted to pornography, was addicted to masturbation, completely free. I do not struggle with any of the things that I have just mentioned. And it is by the power and the grace of God that I am able to change my life and shift it into another direction. So 
If God can do that for me after 40 years of living that way, and it's been over 10 years, let's see, I'm 57 now. So God is, I, I don't even keep up with it, but it's been well oh, that's over. That's awesome. Hasn't, I didn't know that. That's very cool. When did your book well, come out? Ta- did your book come out? Uh, my book's been out about three or four years now. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And I will put that book, uh, all the links in our notes so that you guys can find Kevin's book. Kevin, thank you so much. God bless you, brother. It's so cool that we're all out here doing thank this you now. Guys. I know that, that and you can God- find me on social media. I'm on all, I'm on all the social media platforms so you can find me. Just and go ahead and tell Kevin us where Boyd. Kevin Boyd. Yep. Yeah. He is. Okay. Yeah, Kevin Boyd. So Instagram is Kev. Kev Boyd, 777, Facebook, Kevin Boyd. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, TikTok is KB Set Free. What else? I'm going to write Clubhouse that down. Clubhouse is Kevin Boyd. Um, am I missing one? I don't know my Twitter name. I don't know what it is. All I'm right. sure if you type in Kevin Boyd, it'll pop up. All right. But thank you, guys. Yep. Jesus loved you. So do I. <laughs> I love it. Talk to you soon, Kevin. I hope. All right. Have Bye, a wonderful guys. day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. You're okay. welcome.